are new to the DSA Veterans Memorial Center, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, you can also go to our website at nvmc.org to find out more about the organization. And there's a little pop-up that comes up and it says, join our newsletter, it's kind of annoying. But if you type in your contact information, we'll put you on our weekly Wednesday update e-newsletter that lets you know what's happening here at the center. It is never a request for money, so you don't have to worry that you'll get emails at one o'clock in the morning saying, give us $5 now. Uh, although we always accept it, but we never ever ask. Uh, bathrooms are right outside in the corridor as you came in. Um, we wanna thank Warren Orikasa and Abby Carpet for being a sponsor of this series. Uh, he allows us to put on these great programs. So a big mahalo for Warren. And my name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the executive director here. Uh, Melanie Agrabanti, our research archivist. And our board member here today with us today is Mr. Bo McCoy. And I think that's the, do we have, do we have anybody else? Okay, and of course our wonderful volunteers, Brenda and Donna, and uh, also Brittany Arazumi, who is doing this on Facebook Live for us today. To our Zoom audience, thank you for joining us. Feel free to type in your questions in that little Q&A box at the bottom left of your screen, and we will get to as many as we can. But without further ado, how lucky are we to have the ever effervescent, brilliant, entertaining Kathy Collins. who created this program for us. And uh, it's in its second year. They're third. going into its third yeah. year. So it's we're third year now. so thankful. And our brilliant, talented, gracious, and generous guest, Mulubehi uh, <laughs> Guerrero. So I need to you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you and let's enjoy. Thank you, Deidre. Just one little bit of housekeeping that uh, Deidre didn't mention, and you may have already figured it out. Those of you in the black chairs with the wheels, there are no brakes. <laughs> so please be um, cognizant of that. So one, one of these times, we're going to just have a, a relay race. <laughs> here. Yeah. But because this is the most people we've had for a Yakamashi, um, so many of you have stationary chairs. We have to bring out the extra chairs. But thank you all for joining us. And thank you. I'm so excited. I tried to get Uluvehi as a guest last year. And I think twice we scheduled and yeah. things came up. So we had to keep postponing. But we're so happy you're here today. I'm very honored to be here today. This yeah. is uh, oh, just amazing. I'm getting chicken skin. <laughs> So you already know that uh, Uluvehi is a kumuhula, musician, composer, voice of an angel, mm -hmm. and a Maui boy through and through. So I want to talk story about um, your Hanabata days growing up. <laughs> but first, let's let's just kind of bring everybody up to date because uh, you got a big trip coming up. You have several big trips we coming up. We have several big trips coming up. Because you're returning to Mary yeah. Monarch. Yeah, we are so yeah. grateful for you to the Mary Monarch this year. You know, you can, the, the only way that you are able to be a participant at the Mary Monarch is you have to be invited. And so, you know, you can apply and then it goes before a panel of people and they, say, yes, you are worthy of coming to the Merry Monarch. And so we were lucky and blessed last year that we were allowed to come for our very first time and did so well that they invited us for the second time. So here we are. Wow. Last year, and as you said, you had been there as a musician before, but that was yes. the first time for your halal. Yeah. And I know... Uh, Everybody, we were all glued to our television set, and I cried um, that first day when you folks and you were like second or something yeah. early on in the program. yeah when you're when you're new 
at in the Mary Monarch, they put you in the first lineup. Okay. You're like either, you know, there's like five new groups. So you're like either one through five. Well, we were, there was one and then we were two. And yeah. then, so in a way it was kind of like, I kind of like that because, you know, there's so much anxiety when you go for a thing for the first time and going on before all of your other peer go, you know, af after you, be because you don't want to see all of that because it just gets you more nervous. For me, it gets me more nervous as time goes by. So I, I would just assume to be number one and number two was good. Yeah. So we were happy with that position. Oh, it was, it must have been such an experience for your dancers. Absolutely. It it was, it was, it was really, really the whole journey of getting to the Mary Monarch. Of course, the icing on it was this Mary Monarch stage itself, being, being able to um, share our genealogy, our hula genealogy, our style, and our aloha and the story that comes with us telling of our heritage here on Maui and bringing that to a large arena of audience. It, um, from what I understand, the Mary Monarch is brought to like 136 countries across. And so there are many, many people who, who, are, who love hula, love Hawaii and hula in particular. And you carefully selected the, um, your performance numbers. I know they were all Maui songs. Yes. And yes. And because it's our first time, we wanted to tell the stories and share our hula from Maui. We wear it with like a beautiful lei, so very proudly. And we come with all of that aloha to, to the audience. And so there was there was a lot of people that was sitting forward waiting to hear our story, waiting to see our hula and our music that represents and tells the story of our island where I was born in Leeds. You had a big um, uh, support group there too. I mean, they, when they announced you and your halal, the cheers that went up and, you know, because you folks were number two yes. on the <laughs> roster, I thought, oh, they're all cheering for Maui. But I noticed after when the other Maui halal went on, they weren't cheering as loud. And I found out later, you had this huge cheering section from Japan. Yes. <laughs> we have a large following from Japan and they all came as they are going to come this year as well. Um, and also from Taiwan. Uh, you know, I've been traveling abroad. First of all, I've been teaching now hula for 43 years on Maui. And 27 of that has been in Japan and 10 of that in Taiwan. So our Hula roots are spread way out there, and and I absolutely love being abroad and teaching and sharing our culture. It's it's something so satisfying being able to share a part of yourself and part of your culture and your language with another country that is so steeped in their own, uh, you know, culture. Um, you have several halal in Japan. Yes, yes, all the way from the most northern part from Hokkaido all the way down to Kyushu. So when I go there, we start off in Tokyo and then we go up to Hokkaido and we work our way down. We meander down to all the different cities and then end up in Kyushu. And then from there, we go to Taiwan. <laughs> wow. You'll be going back soon after Mary Monarch? The next month in May. <laughs> yeah, we be going back. Oh. Uh one of my favorite songs that you recorded, wrote and recorded, um, is Nani Kamakura. Yes, <laughs> Nani yeah. Kamakura. Can um, you tell us the story behind yeah, that? Yeah, so uh, when I first went to Kamakura City, and it's mostly known for where the great Daibutsu is, you know, the, the iconic Buddha that you see on many ads and many uh, showing of Japan, the great Daibutsu sits in Kamakura. And Kamakura itself has many, many shrines and temples in that city, like lots of them everywhere. And it was so beautiful because I had first gone there to Kamakura during the spring season when the sakura blossoms were all in bloom. 
And um, as you know, and or may not know, when you fly to from Hawaii there, it takes about nine hours by plane. And so I arrived late at night, went to my hotel, sat, went to sleep. And the next morning when I got up, I opened my window and there in the view was thousands of sakura blossoms in bloom, wow. just pink everywhere. And the breezes, light breezes swirling all of these beautiful blossoms all over. And I was just so, I was just so taken by it that I wanted to share my experience more than, and this is, this comes from me. It's more than just taking a picture, you know, um, being, uh, being a musician and being um, versed in our, in our culture. I wanted to speak of Kamakura on a Hawaiian point of view. So I wasn't, I, I'm, I'm in no way an official person on being on Japanese culture, but I wanted to speak of the impact that looking at something so beautiful from my eyes, from the eyes of a Hawaiian. So the words are all in Hawaiian, and but my experience is from me, it, what I'm saying. And then I wanted to keep it, the, the essence of being in Japan. So we created the song to be in like a Japanese melody. I love Enka music. So <laughs> That was part of the influence there. Yeah. yeah, and the recording itself, the instrumentation that you use, yes. it does. It sounds like one of those big Japanese orchestras. Yeah, right. That, yeah. Like, they're there's they're so full of sound. And I owe part of that to um Kono Fried, who's sitting here in the audience. Um, he wrote all of my musical arrangements for all of the songs over the past 25 years. So um he's we've he's done a terrific job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's just beautiful, and they always giggle when uh, when we play it on our our radio station, the Hawaiian music station, because you know, um, Nani is Nani in Hawaiian, is right? Hawaiian. But in Japanese, it's what it means. Yeah. What? So, so, so I always I... look at that when I say Nani Kamakura. What Kamakura? Yeah. <laughs> what Kamakura? <laughs> so I have a funny story that goes along with that. We were all in Japan, and we were exchanging our our experiences of lay making. And of course the Japanese people embrace everything that is of Hawaii. And so we were, we were doing a lay class and we, sh we the, um, one of the Japanese students came forward and, and showed us her lay. And she, she looked at it, we looked at it and what my student went, oh, nani, you know, in, our, in Hawaii means beautiful. So she goes, oh, nani. And the girl goes, Kore Lei. <laughs> and she goes, Nani, Kore Lei. <laughs> and it went back and forth like that for a few seconds. But I couldn't stop laughing because <laughs> it's it's exactly like that, how that movie, you know, lost in translation, that that kind of thing. But it was so so funny when you at the at the time. <laughs> so you've been teaching, traveling to Japan for over 20 years. Are you fluent in Japanese or at least conversation enough to get by? Enough to get by. I give my um, hula lessons in Japanese, all the directionals. And so it helps. It helps to to do that. And I'm very animated when I when I do, you know, I, I don't just speak from my mouth. I get it all into action and I do it all, you know, so that they, that they can understand. And we we really enjoy it. I really enjoy teaching in Japan. How many students do you have right now in Hawaii? I don't have an exact count, but I would think that as many halal that we go through, it's probably several hundred of them. In, more than in Hawaii. There are more students who do hula in Japan than in the state of Hawaii. Yeah. Every level is this. There are more events and more things about hula. They have quilting, they have ukulele, they have all kinds, even language and chanting now. They send their kids to the university to, to immerse into Hawaiian language. So we have some Japanese students who are fluent in Hawaiian language. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the connection between Hawaii and Japan go way back, yeah. There's yes. that, 
that famous photograph of um, uh, Princess Kuyumani in the in the kimono yes. with the little yeah. umbrella. And from what I recall, so uh, because at one time Hawaii had um, diplomatic relations as a nation with with many other countries, right? And so I, and you correct me if. I'm uh, faulty in my memory, but was it King Kalakaua was wanting to right. arrange a marriage? A marriage, yes. The princess, and yes. uh, it was the emperor's nephew or something, or a, a great advisor's nephew, yes. yeah. and which would really solidify the ties between the two nations. You right. know, but, but it didn't happen. No. Obviously, yeah. But here we are, you know, for a very long time, still having a strong connection to, to Japanese and Hawaiian culture. And then there are a lot of communities throughout um, the islands where um, probably it started with the, the plantations, but a lot of intermarriages um, between Japanese and Hawaiian and and um, the blending of the, the cultures. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what makes Hawaii so unique is that all of these integrated, you know, cultures, the Japanese, the Filipinos, the Koreans. I, I grew up, um, my grandparents on my mom's side is from Hali'i Maile. And um, Hali'i Maile, I remember back in the day, there were, everybody had a plantation house. Everybody's dad worked for the pineapple fields and their moms were at stay-at-home moms and so there was never any type of competition everybody's parents did the same thing we all went home to the same type of lifestyle and it was so beautiful and simple back then and then we also had a place but also like to identify by the different culture we had like a korean camp a japanese camp all of these places and yet we all lived together and we shared it, the values of Hawaii, you know, the values of, of Ohana. And then that's how we got all of these beautiful and tasteful, tasty foods, yeah, from the spam musubi. And how did that happen? Yes. But it's, it's become so world recognized now. Yeah. <laughs> spam musubi and poke bowls, right? Now, all over the place. <laughs> so, um, Hali'i Maile is your family home. On but... my mom's side, yeah. My, yeah. my um, Hawaiian side, my, my grandfather was from the Philippines. And then on my dad's side, my my grandparents were from uh, uh, Happy Valley on Mokuhau Road. You, you know where that family, Maui Family Services now are, mm -hmm. that building? That was my grandfather's store, Guerrero oh. store. It was called G. Guerrero store, George Guerrero store. And he built that house, the store in 1945. And they lived in the store until he could have enough money to build a home that sits behind the store, which is still there. All that whole complex is still there. And he he and my grandmother raised their children, one of them, including my dad, and stayed there for 25 years. And then in 1970, they retired. So I was very fortunate to have so much um strong foundation in our both sides of our family my 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 dad's side the storekeeper and my mother's side was the plantation workers um, and it did not give me a life of privilege i tell you i was like i had to go work pineapple fields like everybody else and nowadays the kids look forward to like mcdonald's or whatever but back then was pineapple fields or canry yeah, yeah. pineapple fields or canry so it was hard especially since my grandfather was a boom operator. He was the one that drove the tractors that collected all the pineapples. And so I think it was on purpose. If he saw me in the line, he would make it fast. <laughs> and everybody's looking at me, hey, that's your grandfather. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I loved about working in the fields was that I worked with a lot of Filipino women they, I, I don't know. I just chose like to be with the women because they brought the most delicious food. <laughs> you know, they had all the cow cow tin, what they called back then, the cow cow tin, and they would pack up all the food. And because I was such a young, I was like 14, they would just malama me. They would take care of me. Like I didn't really have to bring a, a lunch 
<laughs> other times can because they they brought you know they had it all spread out for me so yeah so my my usually my lunch can't consist of like one tuna sandwich or it or egg sandwich in between of that because i knew i was going to eat well for lunch anyway so my lunch was just a snack <laughs> <laughs> so you went to kahului school I went to Kahului school. I attended St. Anthony first, mm -hmm. and then I went to Kahului school where I stayed until I graduated uh, and then went to Maui High School. Classmate in the best. Yes, classmate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, and so that was the, I, I still call it the new Maui High. Right. The Kahului camp there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kahului School is really where you first developed your love for music? Yes. Un well, it wasn't like a chosen thing. <laughs> it it happened because I was such a Kolohe child. So in, in grade school, my parents went through a divorce when I was 11. And I started to act out and just didn't have any type of guidance and just was just doing all kind crazy kind stuff you know as a as a young as a young child and i would be i would be i would have to be kept after school a lot of times back then you know the schools they did punish they actually did paddle you i was gonna ask yeah. if you ever got the pass i got it many times <laughs> and then and then you get it again because they have to call your parents so, so then you get you get from the principal one and it was actually a wooden paddle yeah and then, of course, when your mom finds out and she has to come from work, then you get it again. <laughs> yeah. Her son was hers. Hers, um, particularly was the uh, utensils from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know, like the wooden, the wooden spoon. spoon. So you get the thing. Yeah. And then my mom was like this. She was um a syllable hitter. So like it's like, I told you never to yeah. like. <laughs> Please use the shorter word. <laughs> so we called it syllable licking. <laughs> but there was a lot of times, and so this is where it kind of I got introduced to music. My 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 teacher there was Mr. Kiyoshi uh, Yabui, and he was a, a math teacher. And he was a very gentle man, very patient. I was relentless with my acting out. And I had to stay after school. Back then, when we stayed after school, you either had to go pull weeds or go dust the erase the blackboards or clap all the erasers and mop the floors for your punishment. Well, it became so often that I started to meld with Mr. Yabui in his classroom because he would stay and he he played the piano. He had a piano in his room, he had ukulele, and he taught all, he taught himself how to play the piano. He was self-taught how to play the piano and how to play ukulele. So being around him all the time drew an interest from me because then I wasn't into all of these getting myself into trouble. I was actually listening to him and loving all of the music and the ways that he was sharing it, that I decided that that's what I was going to do. And so I started picking up the ukulele and learning to play the ukulele. And uh, that was my first love of being able to divert this energy that I had as a child where I was just lost. It gave me focus by learning these songs and these, and, and it was, Mr. Yaboy did all kinds of songs, all beautiful kinds of songs. And um, that's how I learned from, was from him um, and, and, and just diverting all of that negative energy into something positive through my music. Yeah. Mr. Yaboy. So I went to Lihikai school. Oh, I'm sorry. And <laughs> so, we wanted to track meet. Yeah. Yeah, back yeah. We had the track meet in the old fairground. Right. Stand. And and Lihikai and Kabuli School were the yeah. big rival. Yeah. We were the Lihikai surfers. Right. We were the Kabuli Eagles. Yeah. And you, you folks would come. So, and we all had. So, this was back when grade schools went up to eighth grade. 
And the track meet athletes were six, grade six through eight. Yeah. And we had cheerleaders right. and everything. And freaking Kahului School, Mr. Yabui would bring the piano yeah. to the grandstand. So they had him play playing the piano. Stuff. Yeah. And all we had were our voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we would all what a Kahului School guy. Like, it's so hot. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> But Mr. Yabui, I know also um, in the evening he had um, ukulele yes. groups that yes. he started. Yeah. Because yeah, I know I remember my mom used to go right. with the the loose leaf binders with the lineogram. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was like the first um, get high thing. Like every every time the paper came out, everybody was like, <laughs> yeah. from the lineogram, right? The <laughs> That was like the first drug off in, in the in, back in the sixties. Everybody like smacked. <laughs> <laughs> we were exposed to so many things back then, but never gave it a thought. Not to get off track, but rem remember this: like in the that was in like the sixties, the mosquito truck that used to drive <laughs> through the neighborhoods, and the man is wearing full protective gear in the truck with the with the mist coming out for spread of mosquitoes and we're running out from the dinner table on our bikes to chase the mosquito truck yeah. and going right behind all of that fume. and the man is with his mask going get out of here you chase me. go back in your house you know and we would survive that that's <laughs> right well, yeah yeah <laughs> When we made mud pies, we would eat the mud pies. <laughs> oh, Crazy. So, decades later, here you are, I mean, besides, you know, your halal and everything, but you had a, an ukulele group going for a long time, just like Mr. Yabui. Yes, did. yes. And I was... um. You know, and and going through all of that, not once did I ever take it for granted. I always was very appreciative of, because of where I could have ended up out of being in a, a child like that, that just running without any type of guidance. And that's why too, I look with so much respect to all of our educators, all of our teachers, because they play such a big, important role. It's more than just sitting in the classroom. It's really taking the time outside of that to. You know, Mr. Yabut invested and took time with me later on. And it wasn't until later on that I became a recording artist and I started to have all of these um, blessings that came forward out of out of what I learned from Mr. Yabui that um, Kalama School was going to have a concert for their school to take the children to the mainland. And so I, I saw the paper and I said, what a great way for me to, to return this giving it back you know how we always say pay, pay it forward and so I called them up and I you know I explained that I wanted to do this for the school and we raised money we had a concert and we raised money and all of the kids went and it came out in a newspaper writing and um, so Mr. Yabui's family saw and heard of me mentioning their their uncle and they called me up and so this is where it comes full circle I, I still get I still get, um, well, pork rinds. I'm not one skinny chicken, so, so pork rinds. I get pork rinds. <laughs> but I got, uh, they, they, they invited me to come uh, to, to meet up with them because when Mr. Yaboy had passed 20 years earlier, they had kept all of his music, absolutely everything everything were in binders and 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 folders and every exactly like how we received it back then in school and they just did not know what to do with it because it was such a valuable collection but they didn't feel like it was worthy of just going putting it out there they wanted to go to someone and they called me up after the newspaper article and said Ulubehi, we don't know what to do with it but we would like for you to receive all of my uncle's life's work and so 
I went down there so quickly to the house and we actually filled up a couple of truckloads of sheet music. And I mean, this is a lifetime. So there's music from back in the 1940s, you know, and, and even before that, all kinds of music and Japanese, Hawaiian, English, everything. And I was so honored to, to receive it. And so um, that put me on another path to keep continuing because after I got it, I said, what are I going to do with them now? You know, what am I going to do with it besides using it myself? I wanted to expose it to as many people as I could who were interested in learning music and, and, and different kinds of songs of culture. Wow. Pork rinds, I like that. <laughs> I'm okay now, and so from now on, I'm, I'm no more chicken skin. Yeah. Pork rinds. <laughs> Were there other, um, you know, obviously Mr. Yabui was the teacher who had the greatest influence on yes. you, but were there other teachers that um, really made a lasting impression on you? Uh, when I went to high school, um, there was um, our high school, our, our band, we had, I was in band for a little while. I took up, and people don't know this, I actually took up uh, in fifth grade in in Kahului School from Mr. Roy Uyoka. Oh. And he taught me how to play the trumpet. And so I played the trumpet, the coronet, actually. Yeah. My grandfather on my mom's side was actually a uh, saxophone player. And he did, he had his own band in the 1940s. And when, when they would go to um, KMBI radio station and the band would play live, play live. for the yeah. radio. I have photographs of him and he was self-taught as well. So yeah, I cannot say that I'm, you know, I just can't go on by myself. I, it's somewhere in the DNA that it came through through my grandparents like that and through the mentors. So, Oh, I remember Mr. Uyoka, I had music yeah. class from him back at Maui yeah. High School. Um, and so at Maui High, you had Mr. K. Yes, I did. Mr. Mr. Kidoguchi. Kidoguchi. And we did. Um, he was the one that introduced us. And because at the time I had such a high voice, I, I, I sang falsetto that I would be the only guy in the in the Wahine section, like oh. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Kidoguchi was all of all of that and more, like so positive in in the way that they taught, and um, it that was a big influence because it helped to bring me out. Maui High School, we had a um, when when we did spring concerts, we had we would do plays like that. I I never shot out for like the the lead part or anything. I just wanted small parts, you know, the kind of like just on the side with one liners, <laughs> <laughs> and invite my whole family just for catch that. But like. <laughs> I going on at the first minute on the second half. Make sure you know the bathroom. <laughs> uh, Maui High Band back in the like 1970s, early 70s oh, was huge. Absolutely. They they had we even had um baton with fire. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we were the only um majorettes, they called them with the yeah. batons. And we're the only ones with majorettes that did with fire was like, I think even before the Samoans came out with the fire, now we still had their majorettes tossing them up in the air and everything. <laughs> Baldwin then. And again, <laughs> looking across the people, oh, those Maui High guys. Because <laughs> you guys did the, the double time. Right. Our to do yeah. and nobody had ever seen that before. We all had marching bands, but and Baldwin, Mr. Joe, love him, um, was very traditional. Yeah. Um, then here comes Maui High with this new teacher from Japan, right? Mr. Kiroguchi. Yeah. And you guys had your um we had the what we called monkey suits, yeah, the very <laughs> traditional um uh, look like organ grinder monkeys. <laughs> 40 brass buttons yeah. that you had to polish. We had inspection before every game, every parade. And here comes Maui High with white pants, white shirt, blue satin sash. And, the... <laughs> and you guys played raunchy all the time. All the time. Yeah. 
I still, when I hear that, I go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. It, it 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 was almost like our our second alma mater when you heard Ranchi. <laughs> so that's your music education and background. How did you? Um, <clears throat> When were you introduced to hula? That's that's uh, that that just came out of nowhere, really. I I was not interested in Hawaiian culture or in I mean, just growing up, I just was doing ukulele and and doing all of that. But I saw an ad in the Maui News, and it said, "Ancient hula for men and women." And I said, "Wow, I like go to that because." Back then, hula was taught in what was known as hula studios. Mm -hmm. So when you went to a hula studio, you learned Hawaiian, Samoan, Fijian, all of the different Polynesian dances, and it was all made for entertainment. It was mm -hmm. to do a show or whatever. There was, it had some kind of cultural significance, but not anywhere like what it is today. Um, and so. I kind of stayed away from that because I was I wasn't the stage type of person to dance out there. But when I when I saw the ad for uh, ancient hula for men and women, I I took kind of interest. It kind of popped me up, and I said, "I'm gonna go and try figure it out and go see." Was very the kind secretive kind because back then not much people men said that they would take hula. It was like People weren't interested in doing that. About what year was this? That was in 1977, probably, because oh, yeah. I graduated. I graduated from school, so I didn't have hula when I was three years old or four okay. years old. It was like I graduated from high school, and so I showed up, and it was you. Uh, it was you know who who came was um was Mike Kumuhula, um Pekelo De. He comes from Keanai, and he lives on Hawaii Island now. But also his teacher, who was with him, was Uncle George Naope, the oh, founder of goodness. the Merry Monarch. So that was my beginning, right from the very beginning with Uncle George Naope and my Kumu Hula. And um, we used to practice Hula every day for like five hours a day, every day. It was, we were so, they sucked us into this energy of learning and wanting so much to be around them that that's what we did. We hung around with our with our teachers, with our kumu, and we stayed with them and we learned everything that we could from them. Wow. It was an awesome time to be around, especially Uncle George, who is the Ahula master, to be around that kind of energy and that kind of love that comes for, for our culture. And that's how it started. And um, one of the students was Kumu Kelly E. Raichel. He and I were hula brothers together. And when our Kumu Hula, Pekelo Day, moved to Hawaii Island, then Kumu Kelly e and myself started our own halau on Maui. It was halau kamakani bili makaha o kawa ula. And we had our hula school for 20 years, at which time we honed our, our love for hula into the, to the style that we have today both Kumu Kelly and I. We have so many memories growing up together doing our hula. Uh, you know, people think, people only realize what they see on stage as the final result of like practicing. But beyond, be, before that, there's so much practicing, there's so much um, researching. Um, the, the, nowadays, you can just Google anything that you get and you can get the answer from there. But before, we actually had to go out and look for it. Like we would read it in the, we would go to like the Bailey House Museum, look through their archives, um, look at all of the information that was left from um, Inez Ashdown, all of her work, um, you know, going through all of these and do doing research and then trying to find the place. So we would go, Kumu Kelly and I would go into the mountains and we would actually go walk and we would go hiking inside there and actually get lost like really get lost like we would sit sometimes when the clouds would come and settle around us when we couldn't see anymore and just have to wait till the weather gets better and then lifts up but 
in doing so, in those things, we really learned how to communicate and relate to the land. Um, and so this is where the word kama'aina comes in. Yeah, the word kama'aina. We know kama'aina as, you know, some people think like, oh yeah, I can get kama'aina rate, I get my driver's license. Kama'aina this, kama'aina that. So yeah, kama'aina discount. So, but the word kama'aina is, kama is child and aina is land. So the child, the child, you know, of the land. But more so, not just being a child of the land, what kind of relationship do you have with the land? That is so important as, as people who live here. What relation do we have? Do we know how uh, what this aina is about from our, from our past? Do we know what are the strengths of this aina? Do we know the name of the winds, the rain, the ocean, everything? All of these things became so important for us to learn because these were written in the form of of the chants and the hula that we were performing. So it, it shifted our minds as a young person to know that hula as we perceived it from growing up, it, is, it was never meant to be entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something that was passed on. It was, it was generational knowledge from our kupuna, from our ancestors passed from these chants, from these words. Everything was done very intentfully and once we learned that, there was so much appreciation because once you learn why you're doing this dance, what that hand motion is, what is the intent of the words that you deliver and how it relates to what you see out there. And so that's what we're taking to the Merry Monarch is our love for our Aina, the love for our place because nobody will love it more than the person that comes from there. And that's what we want to show to the audience in a worldwide area. Yeah. Can you share with us um, the numbers that you have selected and why, or is it secret yeah. until? Yeah, why are you gonna air this tomorrow? <laughs> okay, okay, no, I will share it with you. So before even the fires of Lahaina, of course, we wanted to share our our stories of Maui. And one of them is, of course, going out to, to Lahaina and the importance of Lahaina mm -hmm. itself. And we had no idea that this was going to fall upon Lahaina, but we decided that we were going to take this particular mele to tell of uh, Lahaina's importance because Lahaina was the original capital of or the seat of government from our kingdom. Uh, back then. And then during the change, it, it all disappeared. Everything disappeared. And then the whalers came in and it changed the whole dynamics and everything of, of what people thought of Lahaina. And so this through this story, this is what we are telling about the importance of Lahaina. So our chant that we're doing is called Ehoi Kanani I Li Ho. And Ehoi Kanani means to return the beauty or return the glory to Liho. And Liho is a shorter name of Liho Kabai Eke Eke Ikalan, which means Liho of the waters that recede up into the heavens. And um, that it, it is a mountain range that sits right above where we know as Launio Poco Park. So right above Launio Poco Park, that mountain range all the way down to Oluwalu is that mountain range, Liho. It's a very storied mountain, lots of legends and so forth. But we wanted to tell the story of the mountain that sits above Lahaina as like a protective place. And we know that, you know, we know of every, every culture has a mountain. Yeah, all of these indigenous cultures, they have these huge mountains that are more than just mountains. They're like altars, you know, they're like Oahu for all of these indigenous people. And so we wanted to tell the story of Lihau to return the glory and to return the beauty of Lahaina and looking at it through the eyes of the mountain, of the mountain, of Mauna Lihau. Um, and so it takes us 
chronologically and beautifully in poetry, in Hawaiian poetry, it takes us all through that journey um, throughout that, that area from Keawaiki, which is the original name of Lahaina Harbor, Keawaiki. And it's important when we pay attention to all of these songs or these mele, they, they give the original names. They don't give the names of that was given by people who come in there and build, you know, and, and make it up. Um, these are original names of, of these places. And that's what's mentioned over and over in that. It names the wind, names the rain, names all of the sacred places of, of Lahaina. Um, more importantly, Moku'ula, uh, which was the sacred island, uh, one acre island that was surrounded by 17 acres of marsh land. So we know that Lahaina was very, the, the land was very fruitful because of all that water that came from above. Um, it wasn't until when they covered it that that stopped everything. And so, you know, that's where it is today. But we're hoping that... <laughs> Through this, through this tragedy, that the true beauty of Lahaina will be returned again someday under the right guidance. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, for a one night, what what will your ladies be dancing? Yeah, so a one night is called Aya I Lahaina. Our whole theme is on Lahaina. And like I said, we had no, we, we didn't know that this was gonna fall on Lahaina, but we had chosen our numbers already. So now it, when we go, it's it's gonna be even more meaningful for us. Um, Aya I Lahaina was written by my dear friend, Akoni Akana, who was from Lahaina. And he wrote it for uh, uh, when he was head of Friends of Moku'ula to help raise money and to bring back the, the Moku'ula Island. Um, he had since passed on, but he left us with this beautiful song called Aya I Lahaina, there at Lahaina. And it gives all of the place, sacred place names, the, the sacred wind names, the rains, all of the important names of that area. And it, it, it points out the importance of all of that. So that's what we're doing in that song. Um, in Hula, on the Merry Monarch stage, and maybe when you see it, you, you, you can take notice of these, but there, hula, you don't just get up on stage and you dance. You dance on, you do your performance, and then you dance off. So the coming on is called a hula ka'i, which is a hula end to enter. And then the hula ho'i, which means it's the hula to take you off, to take you off the stage. Um, and so we use, we integrated a chant that was written by Kumuhula uh, Kelly Iraishel in the 1990s when he was a pa'u rider, because we have the Kamehameha Day Parade, um, he was a pa'u rider, and he wrote chronologically his journey when the parade would start from Mala, or go down Front Street, and then end up in Moku'ula. So he wrote that as, as, as a chant. So of course me, I took the chant, <laughs> because I know a guy. <laughs> And I turned it, I turned it into music. So we could use it in the Awana platform. So normally what was written as a chant is going to be sung so that our dancers can bring themselves onto the to the stage. And um, the last verse ends up in Moku'ula, which is appropriate. And then we go into the song Aya Ila Haina. Um, our women are gonna be wearing red dresses, which is significant of Lahaina for red, but also for the royal sacred places that come from there are in red and yellow. These are significant colors. So all of, everything is done very intentfully. It's it's never, it's you never can do this in hula and and, 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 the kind, and say, um, we're gonna wear this style or wear this flower because it's my favorite. Okay. Yeah. Like there has to be a purpose for it. And the judges look, very intentful at that. They, they want to see what your explanation is. Our, our research is part of the whole fun. Being a teacher myself now, I love it because it used to sit on my shoulders or I used to take it on my shoulders to just do all of the research. But I with the Mary Monarch girls, I turned it around and I made them do the research because 
it makes it more meaningful for them to understand when they do research. And once once they get into that and they start getting into the return uh, routine of researching, they just get so absorbed into it and they can see you can see it on their faces that they just want more. And um, so that was part of the fun. And and all the more reason why when we do things on Maui, it's like we're here. We can go over there and go look at it, you know, like not it's not like if I if we did a song for Hawaii Island or Kauai or Oahu, we don't have that visual for us. We're from here. So all the more reason why we do Maui. We're not, we don't have any shortage of stories, I tell you, of anything. And so I always encourage people to go out there and look and, and wonder, what is that peak? What is that mountain? What is that cloud? What is that, you know, there's, there's always some kind of curiosity that comes out of the simple things that is provided by, by nature. It doesn't have to be a building, you know. So with the red dresses, what will the floral? So the florals are, this is a, this is a little complicated on the florals. So of course we're going to use pink roses for Maui, the Lokelani, but we also use uh, the traditional ferns like the Lawae and the Maile, which are, um, which are called, which are called Kinolao or the body forms of the deities of Pula for Laka and for Pele. All of those things are worn. Um, in the traditional flowers, we have a, I don't know if you've heard of uh, a flower. It's not, it's not um, from Hawaii, but it's, they call it the bleeding heart. It's pink, bleeding heart. And we decided to put that in there because of the eha and the pain that Lahaina is going through. So we wanted to put that in there, the bleeding heart. Um, it, it just reminds us that when when people hear the hear us coming in that our choices was lahaina that maybe that was something that we we decided to do to bring awareness to the world about lahaina i mean there's so much sorrow in it but we're not I, as i tell my dancers we're not going there bearing the sorrow of lahaina we're going there to bear the beauty and the and the the looking forward that we are coming to share the love for, from our island to the rest of the world. And that's what we're bringing to the stage is that um, the love for, a, for our place. Oh, so beautiful. So um, it'll be on TV yes. for most of us who yes. won't be able to attend, but those will be best, best seat in the house. Yeah. Um, give us the dates. Mary Monarch. We leave on April the 2nd, and Mary Monarch is 4, 5, and 6, April, yeah. in the evening. Yeah. Oh, looking yeah. forward to, to another beautiful performance. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We have uh, 10, 15 minutes left. We're going to open it up to questions. Oh, the hands went right up. Yeah, I I like know that too. <laughs> they haven't sent they haven't sent it to us. Oh, what yet. the lineup is? Yeah, what the lineup? Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, usually if you go to our halal website, we have a halal website, halal kaulo kala. We usually post it up on there, like what number you know. Oh, today we found out what number we are, so you know we just let people know in our lineup. And you're pretty active on Facebook too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, We'll, we'll pay attention. Yeah. We'll watch for that. <laughs> um, are, do we have any online questions? Yeah. Any other questions from this audience? So the Next members one. Don't allow, does everyone participate at the uh, in Hilo or you just take so many people? Yes, yeah, so we have about 120 students in our halal on Maui, but I'm only taking 10. They go through a rigorous, you know, everything up until the last, you know. So I always tell this is my this is my threat as a teacher. I go, there are 10 of you, but mind you, I only need five. <laughs> That's the minimum that you can put on stage is five. The maximum is 35. 
So I go with the 10 who in my, you know, in my opinion will be the, the best to represent, the best to represent. And I get, it's from the get go already that they know how much they need to put out into it. I didn't realize that the minimum was only five. Yeah, five. Wow. Yeah. Which is nice because it allows a smaller halal to be able to participate yeah. too. And then, of course, you just become more noticeable with five people. When you have a larger group, it's because the audience is right around you. They sit, there's like 5,000 people in that, in that auditorium. And I would think it's easier to have exact precision from five than 35, yeah? Yeah. You teach Kanye also, yeah? Yes. 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 I was wondering if uh, Ogopehi has any, uh, um, you still have the uh, copies of your performances? You used to have CDs before? Oh, or DVDs. Uh, or... Do you both still have old time selling? DVDs? DVDs before. Yeah. So over the over the 20 plus years, we've always had a um concert with the halal, myself and the and the halal at the um, Maui Arts and Cultural Center. And um we normally would, would have DVDs of that. Very limited. I, I'm not sure what we have. We have some we have we still have some. Is that what you mentioned at Nani Akula that Beautiful performance. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. you're talking about his, his recordings, like CDs. Yeah, but you, you love that song, right? Yeah. yeah. You see the performance with um, the Duchess. Oh, with oh, Lynn. Right. Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Arake 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 yeah. Arake so when I, first, when I first released that song, Nani Kamakura, mm -hmm. um, Lynn Araki, she wasn't married yet um, oh. to Ki. To ki okay. Yeah, and um, she was taking um J Japanese uh, shinbuyo. She was doing, and so I called upon her to choreograph because when I presented Nani Kamakura, I wanted Japanese dance shinbuyo dance with our hula dancers. And so when we did the performance, we had oh, Japanese dancing, full kimono, everything on one side, and the hula dancers on one side, and they're dancing to the same song um, in that. And then it ended on the stage with cherry blossoms falling over yeah. all of them yeah so we took that all over including the to the uh nahoku hanohano awards um it, it was it was everybody just uh, thought it was a wonderful idea to bridge the cultures with that one song yeah. Ooh, that gave yeah. me pork rice <laughs> I think we have a Zoom question. Me too. Uh, someone wanted to know what is in the case next to you. Oh, oh. oh this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't bring the piano, so I'm always ready. I'm always ready. Yeah. We have Except time for if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask if they wanted, if the family offered you Mr. Yabui's piano too. <laughs> so I, I always, whenever I get asked to sing a song, um, I always do this song. Um, it was written. It wasn't written by me, but I did the recording of it in 1995, and it actually speaks of the birthplace of my great grandmother, Agnes Pihana, Ohia Pihana, who came from Kipohulu. Uh, she was born and raised there. And all of her children were born in that area of Kipohulu. Mm -hmm. This song is called Kipohulu. <laughs> Pahit 
So, Mary Monarch coming up in just a few weeks. In April, yeah. And then you're going back to Japan in May. the following month. And then you were mentioning another um, overseas trip that you'll be taking with a very exciting if you could just yeah. tell us about that. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've now been teaching in Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan has invited me to an indigenous um, convention, group convention there for indigenous people. And we are we have been chosen from Hawaii to represent Hawaii at their indigenous culture um, in Taiwan. Yeah. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I wonder if that'll be um, shared via the internet. Maybe we can watch it I'm, online. I'm pretty sure they would make it available. Oh, it's so, yeah. Okay, make sure you put that on your um, website. On my website, yeah. 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 I think we are probably just about out of time, maybe even going over. But wow. Mahalo for joining. Mahalo. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's an honor to be able to come in and share with, with all of you, um, share a little bit about myself. I'm very proud of, of where I am in my life and being able to share it um, with the world. And I'm also just even more proud to know that the fact that I come from Maui and that I come from very humble beginnings and I'm very grateful for all of the people, especially my, my teachers, my educate, the ed educators that have been in my life to, to help guide me where I'm at. And because of that, I'm 
going to continue to pay that forward and helping in whatever way I can to help our youth to to be able to keep the traditions of our of our island, the storytelling, and also the different things that we have in our lives um, that make you our island and Hawaii unique and to the rest of the world. Mahalo e na kua, mahalo e na kupuna la e a, mahalo me ke aloha la, mahalo me ke aloha la. Okay, I'm just one big pork rind now. <laughs> Mahalo to all of our guests today and our online viewers. Next Yakamashi is Saturday, May 18th. Same time, same place. And my guest will be, I'm so excited, our First Lady of Maui County, Kaihi Bisin. So <laughs> make sure you join us for that one. It's been over a year since we first scheduled you. I'm so glad you came yeah. out today. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Thank you, Chen.